Hi guys, and welcome to the Love and Guts podcast. Today I have a special friend and mentor to share with you. Her name is Sonia Friedrich. And in this episode, we cover what behavioral economics and neuroscience is, how we can change deeply ingrained behaviors and habits, how long it takes to change a behavior, why human beings are predictably irrational and how it negatively impacts our lives, what heuristics and biases are, and how this influences the decision-making process, why giving your services for free or at a discount is not a good idea if you want people to do the work, why many of us cannot handle being alone. To put it into perspective, many prefer to give themselves an electric shock than spend six to 15 minutes alone with themselves. We talk about what the link is between distractions and addictions and why if you use the word interesting to describe your emotional states, you need to stop. And we talk about so much more. It's such a fascinating conversation. But before we get into the podcast, I want to introduce you to Sonia a little more. Sonia Friedrich has been called a growth hacker. She's a leading expert and keynote speaker. She empowers people by showing how to apply behavioral economics interventions in business and in life. Her aim is that people begin to implement BE IDs within 24 to 48 hours and start to measure the direct impact on the bottom line in less than one to two months. Her proven results are truly game changing. Sonia has saved clients millions of dollars and made others millions of dollars. She has helped build brands up to 250 million in Australia and New Zealand and has repositioned companies, restructured businesses, and helped save small businesses from closing their doors. Sonia was a coach for the Google Startup Weekend. She also works with businesses in crisis and is known for her confidential handling of sensitive issues. She is a mentor to business owners. Sonia loves working with CEOs, company directors, key executives, and to be honest, she has worked with me personally and professionally, so she does not just go into businesses. In fact, it's a very small part of what we talk about. So this applies to everyone. So Sonia works with entrepreneurs, startups, investors, solo operators to multinational clients. She's a mentor to CEOs, founders, and change agents. Sonia is a sought after keynote speaker, and I totally believe that. So guys, you are going to absolutely love this podcast interview. I know that I'm going to be listening to it multiple times over. So many golden nuggets in there. But as always, this information is not intended to diagnose or treat a medical condition. So please ask your health practitioner before beginning any new treatment. And most importantly, just enjoy. And if you do enjoy what you hear, feel free to leave a ratings and review on iTunes or Stitcher so that others find love and guts easily and they can share and enjoy the content from the valuable experts too. Hi guys and welcome to the Love and Guts podcast. Today I have a special friend and just amazing person to share with you. Her name is Sonia Friedrich and we are going to get into so much juice So I'm going to get straight into the questions. Welcome, Sonia. Thank you so much for taking your time out to join me on Love and Guts. My absolute pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. You are very welcome. It was only a matter of time. (laughs) So my first question to you is, A, what is behavioral economics and neuroscience and how did you find yourself working in this field? Sure. I think an easier way to understand it is just to separate the two words. We're looking at behavior and economics and insights that pull the two of these spaces together. So behavioral economics is really the method that applies psychological insights into our human behavior to explain how people make choice, take risks, and in any economic decision making how they go about it. And most of that, it turns out, is actually unconscious. A lot of it is really irrational, yet also very predictable. So that's the world of behavioral economics. And then neuroscience uh, is really any of the sciences that are dealing with the structure and the function of the brain and the nervous system. 
And today we're finding that there are so many um, extraordinary leaders and practitioners in these spaces that are starting to actually be able to map when we make decisions, what's actually firing in the brain and wiring in the brain so we can see where activity is. And it's really starting to change our decision making. Yeah, and the, the second part of that question, and what I really want to know is how did you find yourself working in this area? Because you weren't always doing this, right? No, I was always working in business and uh, I actually come from a background building markets and brands, working mostly with Fortune 500 companies. And then I went out on my own um, in strategic consulting. And then about seven years ago now, I had somebody approach me who wanted to get into the, uh, really wanted to get me to help them build their business in the healthcare space. My background had been very much in the pharmaceutical industry. And I said to him, if you don't have anything new, then I can't really give you my contacts and my networks. Mm -hmm. And it turns out he was really uh, at the forefront of understanding behavioral economics and neuroscience that was coming out of the UK. And I ended up helping him reposition his company as a market research and behavior strategy organization. And it's a bit like the rest is history. We started building new models of doing business that were very successful. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you, you, uh, used to be located in Sydney and then you took some time out and you actually came up this way, northern New South Wales to Byron. Was there a bit of a story there in, in how you parked the work that you were doing and then entered into what you're doing today? Sure, that's that's probably another complete interview. Yeah, it probably is. <laughs> and it really does fit in with the title of your podcast, Love and Guts, because I I was diagnosed with celiac disease and my body really shut down and I ended up giving away my corporate career and really just getting in the car and driving to find where I was meant to be and what I was meant to do. And I uh, I was very successful in the work that I did and I actually gave up my corporate career for quite a number of years thinking I would never go back into it. And I was also quite bored with business. and the status quo of how we actually approach things. So behavioral economics and neuroscience has really been fun for me and really turned on, on its head the way I was taught in university how to build brands and how I successfully did them for 25 years for big business. Mm, beautiful. And how the hell has it actually changed your life? So how has behavior economics and neuroscience changed your life? Where have you seen it have the most impact? Well, the first thing is that it's actually reinvented my career and yeah. put me at the forefront in the application of it in real world experience for both multinational and small business and solopreneurs. On a day to day level, though, I just laugh at myself now because where I thought I was making very informed uh, decisions and that I was being rational in my decision making, I now understand quite a lot of the heuristics and biases of behavioral economics and how my brain works and I see it in play. And I just laugh at myself. So I've become my biggest experiment, really, in seeing the application of behavioral economic insight and then trying it on myself in terms of disrupting my own behavior and uh, and giving space to things. So uh, it's been a it's been a game changing shift in how I see every facet of anything to do with human beings. Yeah, and I'd love to get into some of um, the ways in which you short circuit it when you find yourself going back to that, you know, those heuristics and biases, which I actually think it's probably a good time to get into now. What is sure. heuristics and biases? Well, heuristics really are just a process or process or method, and it turns out our brain is is hardwired to always take the path of least effort. So we can give ourselves a little bit of space when we go, why haven't I done this yet? And why haven't I changed? Or why am I procrastinating? Because it turns out the brain is actually hardwired to always follow the path of least effort. And there's these two different systems of the brain, system one and system two, that, that work together. And one of them is making a lot of decisions automatically without, without too much effort. And then 90% of our decisions come from that space. Mm. The problem is that in that space, because we're making a lot of quick decisions, there's a lot of biases or errors involved in we don't make great choice for ourselves. And I guess the manifestation of that is that, you know, we eat too much, we drink too much, we gamble too much, we spend too much, we don't pay off our credit cards, we have overconfidence that we will. We're actually not very good at seeing our future selves, it turns out. So we tend to focus very much on short-term outcomes and immediacy rather than long-term uh, change. 
Yeah, so you, you said there's around, well, there's more than 600 heuristics, is that right? Yes, I think the field of behavioural economics has really become quite popular since Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize back in 2002 and then Richard Thaler, you may know, won it uh, in last year, in October. And so there's this whole growing industry, actually, of behavioural economists and also uh, business areas and consultancies that are now specialising in different areas of behavioural economics. So I'd really say every day we're finding out more and more about the brain, but there's there's a business I do associate with and partner with in New York, and they use more than 600 of these heuristics and biases specifically in communications for brands. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's like everything, you can't keep up with it all. However, you just find your niche and find what works and and put them into practice so I feel pretty comfortable applying around 250 or 270 of these in practice where I've got real life case studies and success of actually how I use them. Mm, can you give us a couple of examples of heurist some heuristics? Yeah sure so so let's just think about it in relation to I guess change behavior change because that's probably more relevant to your audience is that um, we have this, uh, this area called choice overload. So our brain overloads really, really easily. And in overwhelm, it's like our brain has these mini freak outs and runs away and chooses to do nothing and sticks with the status quo. And there's some simple numbers, I call them magic numbers. So it turns out our brain can handle a list of six things, but as soon as we add in the seventh thing in a list, it requires 500% more energy. So if let's say you're putting together just a list of your services, if you've got too many in a list, people will remember the first and the last, they won't bother reading the rest. And there is sort of another magic number, which is magic three, and that our brain is also hardwired to compare. So we like comparison. If you give me just one thing, it's the same. My brain doesn't really know how to evaluate one thing. Whereas if you give me two things to compare, you actually get better engagement. So it might be, would you like to go on a weight loss program or an exercise program? Suddenly I'm in engagement versus when would you like to start your weight loss program? I have a bit of a freak out. And it's some small, we're playing around with what we call small nudges. So small, uh, small insights and interventions that actually have big shift in changing behavior. Yeah, that's so fascinating when I hear you talk about those things. And I've worked with um, Sonia in the past, both both personally and professionally, and, and those little nuggets, those little behavior, um, what's the word for it? Those those ways that we tend to lean towards as human beings, I just find so fascinating, so freaky and so fascinating. Um, but obviously, I'm a health practitioner, and I, as you know, I make suggestions to people that often requires them to, to change deeply ingrained behavior and habits. So I want to talk a little bit about that. And the first question being, why, why do you think it's so hard for us human beings to change behavior and habits? Like, why are we so resistant? Well, I think it turns out to really a fundamental understanding of what we know is loss aversion. And from a basic level, again, we have this ingrained fear of loss and we, we fear losing something more than we value gain by a ratio of just over two to one. And so that means that we would rather stay in our current position, even if we know something's better for us. So even if we know the weight loss is better or we shouldn't eat certain foods because they make us sick, that um, we, we would prefer sometimes to even stay in our trauma than disrupt that current, current status quo when we know something else is better for us. And there's been some excellent work on breaking um, breaking behaviors and meeting uh, goals from uh, Dean Carlin, who is a professor of economics at Yale University. And he's done quite a lot of work in the area of commitment contracts, uh, specifically around savings and quitting smoking. However, they're effective in, in every aspect. And there's, there's seven aspects of behavior change that if you apply them, you actually can shift people's behavior by consistently by around 86%, which when it's normally zero is quite extraordinary. And his his results are, um, are amazing. And I have taken some of his findings and adapted that to create my own commitment contracts for both business and personal uh, clients of mine where they're wanting to change something either in their life or even in their business. Mm, yeah, and do you, did you wanna share some of those? Are you using sure. some of his seven 
Yes, I, I have. I think I've, I've created a, a few for me as well. And I guess I think the first thing is that we all know that people have to believe that they can actually meet the goal. And so I think there's potentially two issues there. One is actually driven from the practitioner where sometimes we might be just grasping for clients and we choose the wrong ones. Mm. And we, in fact, we need to give ourselves some more space and uh, hold the space that the right clients will come in who are ready for change. And so the other is that often we set the goal too big and our brain likes to chunk things down. As I mentioned before, we're not very good predictors of our future self. So if we take a big goal and you ask a client, does this feel like it's something you can achieve? You can see it in them. Mm -hmm. You can see whether or not their body and their cellular structure believes that it can achieve it. And if you can see that it does, not they don't look like, you know, you can look at somebody and you can actually say, look, it doesn't look like you believe that you can achieve this and give them that permission of vulnerability. And then what happens is you just chunk it down to a goal that actually they can achieve and start there. So. So the first thing is to break it down to something that can be achieved. The next is to get them to commit to it in writing because we know they've got a 40% more chance of achieving something in that space. We know that if you set up a referee, they're twice as likely to reach their goals and feedback loops become really, really important in this space. And by Setting referee, you mean just, you know, uh, inviting someone else in on the change that you're deciding yeah, so to make? Absolutely. So it's setting up with somebody that you really, really trust will hold you accountable to reaching your goal and that you set in dates and times to check in with them, which depending on the degree of the goal might be daily or it might be weekly or monthly. And then uh, it turns out as well, Linda, that in the past, I think we focused a lot on reward, thinking that reward will actually be the trigger for people to change behaviour. And the work of Dean Carlin and his, his co-founders has actually showed penalties have a bigger impact and this gets right back to what we were saying earlier about our loss aversion so instead of then focusing on let's say the weight loss what happens is you focus on losing this penalty and we've actually shifted the loss aversion and that's been the, that is the disruptor to getting change it's really really powerful I've, I've seen it work with my clients and it's it's actually quite extraordinary how quickly it can actually have an effect Mm. Yeah, yeah. You've mentioned that a few times um, with some of the people that you've worked with, where they've um, their penalty was giving a certain, a substantial amount of money to maybe a political party that they didn't kind of believe in. That was one of the the things that Absolutely. I think you've mentioned in the past. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, his his De uh, professor Dean Carlin's work shows that. When you put financial stakes in the game, not just losing something else or saying, well, I won't go and have my massage, but if you actually put money in the game, it has more likelihood that you will, or more impact on you reaching your goal. But critically, they've worked out that if you are going to give money to, an, well, they call it an anti-charity, so a political party or it might be a sports team you dislike, it's about setting emotional saliency where you go, there's no way I'm going to give them, you know, it could be a dollar, it could be $10, it could be $10,000. Depends on how much is emotionally salient for you that is a penalty that is great enough that you stop thinking about the weight loss and you start thinking more about there's no way I'm going to give them that money. And because of that disruption, you actually find you change your own behaviour. And I do like that you said um, chunking the belief down or the lack of belief down because initially I was like, ooh, I get quite a bit of patients who at the time don't believe that they might be able to lose the weight. And so, you know, rather than discard them because they, they don't believe it at the time, I like the idea of just chunking it down to, well, do you believe that you can, we can achieve this small increment first mm. before moving on to the bigger, bigger nugget? Because I'm thinking also, you spoke a little bit about trauma. Um, I'm thinking of some people that I work with who have had past trauma, it might be abuse, and then they're carrying quite a bit of weight. And they may even recognize that that is why they're carrying the weight because they are afraid or do not feel safe to lose it. And yes. So, yes. yeah, yeah. So, well, I think there's a lot of self identity then that's involved in that space that has held them. And there's obviously layer upon layer there where we're dealing with, you know, trauma or people's sense of self and what it takes to actually rebuild that in a human being. And for some people, it might even have a, a layer of an addiction or something that's involved. Okay. So, the other question I had is that there's this old belief, which I believe is old, and I could be very, very wrong, that in order to change a habit, it takes 21 days. Now, I've um, 
read The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg, and he speaks a lot about it's actually not 21 days, it's more like 10 weeks where we're able to really break the cues and change a habit or behaviour. Is Where do you sit with that? I think there's, look, there's a lot of research and insight that's been done and certainly I think it's powerful to understand our own habit loops, whether they're personal or organisational. I think that's a really core understanding. However, I, I actually think, and I have seen change happen, I'd say in milliseconds, mm. and it is using this different model, which is bringing commitment contracts in place, and I've seen it happen very quickly. The critical factor for me is the readiness for somebody to change, and when they are ready, that you actually have a format and a process that works. And you know the work that's come out of um, stick.com, I'm not sure if you're aware of it, it's STI ckk.com it's a it's a free website that he and his founders have set up for people to actually put in their own commitment contracts and so far um, there's been more than what is it 23 million cigarettes that haven't been smoked more than or nearly 400,000 commitment contracts that have been written where people have put financial stakes on the line to to use this process that applies these elements of behavioral economics and there's been more than 35 million dollars in penalties put on the line now those those behavioral changes using this are disruptors so it's a different model of behavior change to i think traditional models mm. and i agree i think we're at a different place of understanding human behavior and disrupting things because of our understandings of uh, loss aversion and binding commitments. Mm. And I guess it's it's rather than having those blanket statements of it takes 21 days or 10, 10 weeks to change a habit, it's a very personal thing. And like you said, with this particular, these t- techniques and strategies that you use, and if they're ready, all of that combined in the recipe can make for a very quick shift. Absolutely, and I think I love that stick.com idea. That's fantastic. Yes, it's it's really powerful. It's really really powerful. And to see something of that magnitude be so successful, then I go, well, the proof is there. There's a couple of other things that you just alluded to, and I think every practitioner would understand that the way that you frame something to a patient and what expectations you set up really actually also primes them for what they should expect. And, and what they will expect. And so if you say it's going to take 21 days and it could be difficult, you can already, I already feel contracted and I think, oh, maybe I'm not gonna get there. Whereas if you say, look, we know that we can do this, it's, it's a big behavioral change, however, I'm gonna be here to support you and make it easy. I already know that as a patient, I feel more expansive and I feel held. So actually priming as well as framing things as easier versus more difficult, mm we set those expectations in motion right at the very beginning. Yeah, absolutely. And and what I'm hearing there as well is that even in the way that you worded that there wasn't any um, uh, like strict guideline of when you should expect to achieve this, because what I think in this day and age is that people want a quick fix. And so you do want to actually say to them, as a health practitioner, this may take a little bit of time, but you know, you're going to get little rewards along the way. You may we, you may notice other symptoms fall away, but your bigger goal might take a little bit of time. So, but because I always find that a little bit of a challenge too, because people expect an overnight fix, yet it's taken many, many years for them to get to this state of health. Um, so, yeah, I do like that. I'm going to re-listen to that, Sonia, and, and use those words <laughs> myself. <laughs> Well, I think you're picking up on something that's happened societally, which is this whole space of instant gratification. Mm. And it's happening in every aspect of our life, which obviously then we go, well, I'm coming to you as the practitioner. And I think every practitioner knows as much as a patient might want to hand over the responsibility of their life and their health to you, that actually isn't the way behaviour change works. Everybody is individually responsible for it. And I don't think the healing journey is actually for everybody. At that core level, I think it is a very difficult process to be that honest with yourself, Mm. to understand what you've been afraid of and to revisit your trauma and heal it. And I I think, you know, as a practitioner, that's something really important to hold and Mm. make sure that it's held through the entire process for every patient. Yeah, absolutely. And to not um, get attached to any outcome, good, bad or ugly. (laughs) Well, absolutely. And I think if a... If your customer is setting the outcome, you really are just the 
the channel, I think, to help guide them in the process rather than set anything for them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, nothing pleases me more than actually working with someone and seeing them become so much more aware of of their body and how it responds to certain emotions, certain foods. Like that for me is like job done. Job done, Linda. You know what I mean? Because it's it's them, their body is so intelligent. I mean, it needs me along the way, possibly, to, to help guide, but not actually to fix or heal. I think it's them doing the healing. So when I see that, it, it really excites me. And I, I really feel like 95% of my work is done when that sort of stuff happens. Yes, and that's you seeing your instant gratification. There yes. <laughs> I'll just edit that out. I don't I don't want instant gratification. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, you know, you kind of you want to hopefully feel as though you're you're making a difference and that you're able to to support people. I think it's really powerful when they, they, when somebody trusts you enough with a change that they want and they've come to you saying they're ready, I hold that now really um, quite in a precious state mm. because I realize how difficult it is for people to change behavior yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. and so I guess the other question about behavior as well is that you know you might find people commonly return back to an old ba- way of being an old safe way of being why do you think that is why do you think that we are you know that's that's really um something quite common that we do as human beings Well, I think that's our wiring, you know, if something is hardwired, I think we all know that, you know, neurons that fire together wire together. Mm. And so we're trying to usually disrupt a an entrenched wiring. And we need to create something that either that disrupts it, and then try and wire something new. And if then we get triggered, often, um, we start seeing whatever our story has been, and we go back to, you know, um, we, we regress often um, to what something that may have happened to us in childhood or that sparked that issue. And, and I think it's also our hardwiring of the status quo. You know, we have defaults all the time for every aspect of our life and for each of us, they're different. However, we have default behavior for everything. Mm-hmm. And so behavioral economics is about using insights and interventions to disrupt that entrenched behavior and often without people being aware that that's being used. Mm. I love it. So I've read a couple of your articles and watched a video here and there, and obviously I know you and have worked with you, and you mentioned that human beings are predictably irrational. So I wanna know what you believe that to mean and how this negatively impacts our lives. Sure, that's really a term coined from Dan Ariely, and some of your listeners may be aware of his work and his book called Predictably Irrational. And if they haven't read it, I thoroughly suggest that they do. I, I think Dan's been very um, generous in bringing in behavioural economics at a layman's term, layman's point of view. So I call him our L plates of behavioural economics because if you come in at a different space, it might just be too much to hold. Mm-hmm. And having said that, he's he's not that. He's so intelligent. He's a professor at Duke University in uh, behavioral economics. And so what it turns out is these heuristics and biases that you mentioned and we've been speaking about is that each one of them is a behavior that is usually irrational. So it makes no sense that when there's seven things in a list, we overload. Like if, mm-hmm. if you put a list in front of me, I wouldn't think, I'd go, and you asked me, did I read everything in front of me? I'd say, yes, I did, Linda, I did. And I wouldn't be consciously aware that actually my brain has gone elsewhere. And so I call it the eyeball test where you just slow down and watch where your eyeball diverts and jumps to. And so what happens is you start becoming an observer to yourself in every type of human interaction. And you start seeing that actually, yeah, things are irrational. The critical work is that we, the behavioral economists have proven that we all follow these same heuristics and biases and because they're predictable we can dial them up and dial them down the negative way that it's impacted my life and most of us is that we've just been unconscious to it and more than 90 percent of our decision making comes from that space Mm. despite us wanting to believe it doesn't yeah 
Beautiful. And I think I like the layman's term, so I think I'm going to, as soon as I get off the, this podcast with you, um, order that book, Predictably Irrational. I'll try to say that a few times. That sounds <laughs> fantastic. It definitely sounds right up my alley. I think, you know, being able to deliver the information in really in layman's terms is how you get the message across for a lot of people like myself that's for sure absolutely <laughs> and it was the same for me that's really where I began with my journey on behavioral economics so I read a lot of his work and Richard Thaler's work before I moved on to Daniel Kahneman's which is more like the thesis of behavioral economics oh uh, you've just lost me thesis sorry <laughs> <laughs> So can some of the principles you use, because you work a lot with corp- uh, corporates, corporates at the moment, and obviously you work one-on-one with people like myself, who is not in a corporate environment, but can some of the principles you use to influence behavior in a corporate environment be applied to patients and practitioners? Are there sort of, obviously there's the um, predictably irrational behavior that we all sort of tend to have, but are there some sort of crossovers some big crossovers well actually all of them are so this is where our learning in behavioral economics can't separate you know your work from your your personal life it's about human behavior so anything that involves a human behavior is usually got an opportunity for a behavioral economics intervention Mm -hmm. and so it doesn't matter if you're a corporate trying to influence somebody with price you're a practitioner also putting your pricing in front of one patient Mm. and we know that well the work that I've done over the last um, seven years has really come up with around 19 of these heuristics and biases that impact how people choose to purchase something and the critical thing is that none of them have anything to do with the value of the good or um, and that was something that's very different in our nature to understand Mm. so every one of these you know 600 odd heuristics and biases in my my feeling can impact a patient or they can impact a customer and for me I see it in my life and I see it in my even in my relationships I'll give you a a quick example that let's just say I was um, wanting to suggest something to my partner again rather than suggesting one thing because I now understand that my brain likes to compare I might say well would you like to do this or this and simply by shifting my dialogue I get engagement rather than defense and that's just because I understand the brain or small things can have massive impact like food where we know that once you if you haven't eaten our glucose levels go down and our mood states change and just by having something small to eat completely changes our emotional state and outcomes by up to 64 percent so for me as an individual whether it's again having a conversation with somebody I know versus a corporate client I never have meetings now um, late in the afternoon or late morning because I know that I can put all this work and energy into say a pitch or a presentation and just by choosing the wrong time of day because none of us have eaten Mm -hmm. I actually am going to get a negative outcome and you can say is that all it is and I go yes where I'm where I've been used to major business processes and spending millions of dollars to build brands now I go let's just try these nudges and let's measure the outcomes Mm -hmm. so there's some powerful shift that you can actually incorporate in every aspect of human behavior and I'd say that becoming aware of your own status quo sorry status quo bias as a practitioner is as important as understanding that of your patients yeah and it's such so practical but yes I uh, 100% agree with you I love that you've got that stance of even even having an appointment with your one-on-one patients you know have you eaten let's do it after lunch or early morning or whatever it might be working around you know, people and the practicality of it all. And I think, um, I don't know if this is in the same realm as well, but I think as a practitioner or in whatever role, maybe you've got your own business, working around how you function best. Like for me, I prefer to have most of my appointments, um, you know, either early in the morning or later in the afternoon. And there's certain things that I kind of block out throughout the day because they're very important to me, whether it's, you know, uh, meditation and yoga in the morning. I won't be having appointments really early. And, you know, there's all these things that I do to preserve my mental health so that I enter into these consultations um, being able to give properly, you know, is I think really important getting to know your strengths and how you work best as well. Absolutely. I think 
I think that's been a big shift for me where a lot of us have been told it's selfish to do that and actually I find it's quite the opposite. I think it's quite selfless now mm. is that I know that if I haven't spent the time doing what I need to get myself in a space where I am present, then I have nothing to offer anyone. And so why should I even begin? And for me, it's knowing that when I'm in those moments where I haven't done that, I have choice in that moment to keep my day spiraling out of control, or I can just stop it in that moment and take, you know, sometimes it is three breaths or do a power nap or do what it is that's required or stop your day and just start it again tomorrow and mm. be honest enough with yourself to go, today isn't working, so stop trying to make today work. You know? mm. so, yeah, and, absolutely. And, allow, and when you do have your own business, you have you have the ability to create your own rules. And I'm with you, Linda. You've got your way of nurturing yourself so that you can give. And I have my own practice that I know if I don't do that, I'm not very good for myself or any for anyone else. 100% no one wins. And this is going to be a really, you know, uh, not really in the same realm, but I kind of go when you call someone and they pick up the phone and they actually don't have time for you, like they might be in, in a meeting or they just don't have time to talk to you, I would much prefer someone not to pick up the phone to do it when they're actually able to give you that time. If it's just a matter of, hey, Linda, I'll give you a call in five minutes. Yep, no problem. But I think, you know, there's that just having those boundaries in your mm. day so that you win, they win. It's just, it becomes a bit more flowy than, than a really disrupted, frustrating oh, day. Absolutely. And I think, again, it's how you handle those scenarios. So for me, anytime I call somebody and they answer, my first question to them is, do you have time to speak now or shall I call you back? Yes. Which is, again, giving uh, context and two options. And then it also gives them an out where they don't feel pressured that they have to speak with me right in this moment. And if they can, then we do. And if they can't, we just reschedule in that in that moment. So again, I think we have lots of opportunities where we take that responsibility on ourselves rather than blaming someone else. Yeah. Okay. Good advice. <laughs> I'll be doing that a lot more. So can you shed some light on why individuals often do not work, uh, do not do the work required to have lasting results or change? Change, yeah, that's the word. When a service such as, say, naturopathic or a nutrition consultation or mentoring is discounted or given for free? Sure. Hopefully Great that question. makes sense. That's a very good question. So, the way our brain works is um, well, for, I'll take one step back is I think when we're running our own business, we often think, well, if I discount this, I'll get some more people in and that'll just get me over the hump this week or this month financially. And we have to really understand what happens in the brain. And, and I can be honest, when I was working on bigger brands, I wasn't aware of this degree of the wiring in the brain. So let's imagine that your service is $100 an hour. And what happens is I come along to see you and I, I create a value for that $100 and I go, Linda's worth $100. This is what I'm going to get. Isn't she fantastic? Then tomorrow what happens is I see that you're discounting your service by 20%. And now it's actually $80. And the first thing I feel like is I've been ripped off because you've known that you were going to discount your service. And even if you didn't and you cho chose to do that that morning, that's what I'm believing. The second thing that happens though is, and it gets back to loss aversion. Loss aversion is, is quite an underlying foundation in a lot of principles in our behavior. And so what happens is where we've wired value association or where I've value, wired value association for that $100 and what I think I'm going to get, you've now told me it's only worth $80. And so my brain rewires that all that service I now get for $80. So I love getting a discount because I go, great, I've just made $20. The problem is that my brain can't rewire that loss aversion and that discount, the $20, back up to the $100 level for the same service. And it can actually not do that ever. Mm. So we end up harming our brand value when we offer discounts. Then when we look at when things are given free, 
it's a little bit the same. Our brain actually on one level, we get this double dopamine hit in the brain when we use the word free. So we go, oh, wow, wow, wow. And again, our loss aversion goes, fantastic, I didn't have to pay any money. However, when I hand over cash, I also am making a value association. So if you're saying to me, you're not worth any money, my brain goes, I can get it for free. And my loss aversion kicks in and says, I got it free before, I want it free again. And so I never go back to actually wanting to pay the full amount and physically I don't do it. What needs to happen then is you actually have to redo your services and call them something else to actually put the, that value back on. So from a, a financial perspective, when you actually understand the wiring of the brain around discounting and free, absolutely give something away free that doesn't cost much and doesn't have a true impact on the value of your business and the core offering because you'll never be able to recover from it if you give it away once. Mm, makes total sense. Makes total sense. So I'd love for you to share some ways that we can begin to change some of our default behavior. And you've spoken a little bit about this in um, an article about some four steps. Uh, did I? <laughs> yeah, I think it was on how, oh, actually, no, no, that was for something different. So let's start with that first question. I'm jumping ahead. Yes. So what are some ways that we can begin to change? Oh, the I'm default? sorry. I think I know what you're saying. Yes, that's yes. more about enjoying yeah. the change process, which we can get into. Well, um, so maybe it's about, I can actually set up, if you like, um, how we look at things differently from a behavioral economic point of view and the questions we ask ourselves now. Yep, go for it. Okay. So what's really shifted for me is how I start any uh, problem. And in the past, I might have said something like, I need to create awareness to help build this brand or I need more people to like me, I need to get more people to know about me. And that's been a model, we called it the AIDA model, um, which has been around really since the 1900s in advertising and most businesses um, continue to follow. And behavioral economics says we can leapfrog it and we can really just look at behavior change. And so today the difference for me is the first thing I ask is what is the actual behavior we want to change? And this can be really, really difficult for us to identify. Then the second one is to identify the default behavior. So that is in that moment in time, what happens? So let's give an example that in that moment in time when something emotional happens, my default is I'm an emotional eater. So the first thing I think about is, oh my gosh, what can I have to eat now? And I go to the cupboard and sitting in the cupboard is a bag of chips and so I eat the chips. So the third question we ask ourselves is how do we disrupt the default? So that's where behavioral economic interventions can come into play. One is a choice architecture intervention. The next time I go to the cupboard, there's no chips in there or we've put them out of my reach or there's a lock on the thing and my partner's got the key. So there's all these different things we can do. Or what I can do is go, I can feel this rise in me, which is really an addiction. And I go, this is my default behavior is when something too emotional has come into play that I'm too scared to feel my first thing is actually becoming aware that I eat and so if I'm aware of that behavior we actually chunk it down into the steps and I go just give yourself a minute and if you still want the chips go and get them but just give yourself a minute to see and feel what just happened in that one minute beforehand what happened and this is what I do I say what happened that I'm too scared to look at and what was the emotion that I'm too scared to feel and then if I'm smart enough I actually go through a series of questions to go what's really going on in this process and I can heal from that which is is not really behavioral economics I have to say it's more actually just my own healing journey however what I'm doing is giving myself space to observe a behavior pattern that has previously worked for me in the negative and gone, I'm going to just stop and feel rather than get up and act and go to the bag of chips. Mm. Yep, I love that. And do you physically write it down? When I initially started this journey, yes, I did. And uh, the person, I mean, I went on my own healing journey after I had my celiac disease that was completely unexpected. And really, I gave myself a lot of time to go through that process. and detox from the corporate world and detox from my life and and so what I saw in that space yes I, I really became an observer to my thoughts causing um, psychosomatic impact on my physical being 
instantly mm. and I would stop and go I'd ask myself a series of questions which were what just happened in that moment what was I too scared to feel and then there's a woman Debbie Ford you may know of her she's got some amazing work in just going well where does those feelings come from and a process that would actually at the very beginning I maybe took two days to go through these questions I can now do in 10 minutes mm. and instead of staying in my trauma and that then overtaking my life for that moment in time, I can be with it and heal from this and move on and have my authentic power. Mm. And did you find that it was quite obvious to tap into what the free feelings were when you stopped to actually have a think about why you're going to grab the bag of chips? I think today, yes, I can say that's really easy for me. If I try and recollect, I'm speaking about 15 years ago now when this first started, I can honestly say I was a workaholic, uh, probably binge drank in the advertising industry, you know, on weekends. And I don't know, I think, you know, most of that is that relationship of the authentic versus the adapted self and you have an addiction to numb out feeling. So yes, it takes a while to actually understand what a feeling is again. So initially, no, I don't think I really understood it. However, I did say to myself, you're going to sit here until you can work out what you're feeling. And that journey can be quite confronting. Mm, I'm sure. And I'm sure in the beginning you might just be coming up with that you're just feeling certain feelings rather than knowing where it's coming from or, you know, what, you know what I mean? Like there's deep Absolutely. sadness or there's maybe there's some things that people may not be ready to look at initially or they may have suppressed for a number of years. So, yeah, I'm just, yeah, curious about that process. But you mentioned the, the what I wanted to get to as well, which I'm uh -huh. glad that we're going to answer, is how can we enjoy the process of change? You've written an article about this, about some four steps that we can make the change process a little less painful. Have you got them there? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll let, I can always whip it up. We can always come back but, to that one. Okay, <laughs> Actually, not, let's come well, back to that. What I'll do, yeah. I'm going to ask you another one because the other one's a, another one's a biggie and I want to try to get through them all. I always find these conversations with you, Juicy Sonia, so uh, let's do them all if we can. So you speak a lot. You wrote another article about people cannot handle being alone. Lots of us can't handle being alone. And in this article, you stated, many of us can no longer handle time alone. Recent studies published in the magazine Science show that the majority of people would prefer to give themselves an electric shock than spend six to 15 minutes alone with themselves, which completely just blows my mind because I'm a person that actually loves their own time. So I want to know why you think that is, why we don't like being alone. And uh, sure. how do distractions relate to addictions mm -hmm. and that sort of thing? Sure. I think it's extraordinary too. It's pretty scary that uh, these studies were done, you know, and set up as experiments where, yes, people actually gave themselves an – they could sit there and just be with themselves or they gave themselves an electric shock and preferred that over silence. Right. And I think that is really the core of a lot of um, us numbing ourselves and being really scared to feel – and for me, that's really the core issue of a lot of our disconnectedness uh, to ourselves is that rather than spend time to feel and be in that space, you would rather do something that is um, harmful, which also is what an addiction is. And so I think I know I had, a, I could say, a career of doing things that today I'd say, yes, were completely harmful to me as a being even though I love my career, you know, being a workaholic is harmful. And then you're not aware of it when you're in it, Linda, I don't think. Mm. You're actually doing those things and they give you moments of self-soothing. The problem is that we need more and more moments of them. And, you know, it's like you need a bigger, bigger hit, whether it's work or shopping or whatever your, your addiction of choice is. And I also say that even if it's yoga, you know, some people think, well, I'm doing yoga all day. And I think, well, is that because you're too scared to feel? Or we know a lot of people who might give up alcohol and then suddenly become triathletes because they're now obsessed with fitness. It's still actually avoiding the core of whatever their underlying issues are. 
and just being in distraction the complete that time. Mm. And I think I know for me, I look at I don't know. It took me getting sick. That's really the honesty of it. I got sick, and I was very lucky. I got a wake up call in my mid thirties, and yes, it in one way saved my life. So I see it's the best thing that ever happened to me because I woke up. And instead of being scared of understanding the layers of myself, I love them. I love finding something else that has gone on there and I can laugh at it. I didn't do that at the beginning and I went through a lot of work to get to that place, but I didn't see it as scary. And I think for some people, there's different levels of trauma and whether it's you know, physical, emotional, psychological, the critical thing that I like in some of the learnings I've had is it's not about the actual trauma itself. It is about the emotional charge you still hold with it. Mm. So somebody else may have been told that they're stupid and that can have more weight and have caused more damage than some physical abuse in somebody else because they just don't have that emotional attachment to it. So I think what we then do is we self-distract you know, we keep busy, we keep busy, we keep busy. And, and Linda, I remember right at the beginning of this process, one day I was sitting at my table and I thought, I'm not getting up until my mind stops thinking and telling me another thing to do. And I literally sat on my hands because every moment I'd think, I'll just get and write my list because I might forget things. Or I'll just go and get myself some water because I might be, be here for a while. And I'll just do this and I'll just do that. And I went, no, you're not moving. And I literally sat on my hands and I was in this space, I'd say, for about three or four hours where I then felt every emotion come up with all these interjects and what I realised were voices of, you know, society, school, religion, bosses, family. Most of them weren't my own. And I thought, here I am in my 30s, I don't even know what my voice is. Mm -hmm. So I chose just to be until my mind shut up. <laughs> mm, no, I get it. And I think, you know, I used to be one of those people that were... Uh quite distracted by my social life would go to rave parties and be a bit of a party girl and uh and I walked away from that a little bit and I thought at the time and it was really hard because I felt very isolated all my friends were still going out and partying but it looking back on it it was a very big distraction because it for me took more courage to be uh, like to be sober, to be, you know, be with my thoughts rather than the distraction of the party and the, the quick fix almost, you know. Um, so we spoke a little bit about actually going back to something because, you know, there's those thoughts of is it relevant to go back and um, dredge up the past and all that sort of stuff. But a part of me is like, in order to understand where a deeply ingrained belief has come from, sometimes I need to go back to that and go, where did that come from? Because is it even valid? Do I need to look at that scenario and go, that's actually not valid in my life now. And then in that way, I can extinguish it. By having sure, I understand. Different... Yes. Yeah. So what's your I thoughts think, on that? I think this is very personal. You know, I don't, I don't understand NLP. However, I know a lot of people who ask me, is that what you do? And I go, no, yeah. <laughs> I work on marketing and behavioral economics. And I think we can disrupt change. However, I'm more inclined to be with you. And my personal preference is I would like to know where something's coming from so that I don't just shift and disrupt unconsciously a behavior and I'm now just um, creating something else over the top of a trauma that is still living within my being, you know, and on a cellular level still there, I've just pushed it further and further down. Yep. I would rather open it up, see it and let it go. And for me, what I find is that it's more the fear of what I think is going to happen rather than what will happen when I discover what it's come from. Yeah. And usually I go, oh my God, it's just gone. It's, it's literally just uh, evaporated out of my body. Whereas I can even feel that previously it was like these boulders on my shoulders. Mm. And so I think there's a mixture. I, I don't come from that psychology background. However, I know there's some therapist who would say, look, it could, for some people, it can take years and years of therapy. For others, it's just, let's have an intervention, you know, and let's, let's just you know, split you and and some people are that. They are split, you know, they literally, their being shifts and they can go into another place mm. 
and they just forget it and go, I'm moving on with my life because I just don't want to go there. Mm. So I think it's very personal and I think you need to, the biggest thing for me in that is I think you need to know your own personal preference and not have a practitioner tell you what your preference ought to be. Mm. So what does alone time look for you, look like for you at the moment? How do you like to get that, a dose of it or two or three? Sure. Uh, a mixture. I have. Uh, I start my day very much with meditation and I prefer to always go, for, I'm lucky I live in Byron Bay, so I prefer to go for a swim in the mornings. However, I also find a lot of mornings I just can't go and see people. And so I prefer then to do some stretches or yoga here at home. Some alone time for me though can be often as simple as a breath. If I'm in in my day and things are happening and they're busy, I go before I do the next thing, I really need to come back to me. So I just stop and I give myself some time. And the critical thing for me is try and turn off my brain. And then before anything is set an intention of how I want that next thing to be, what is the next outcome, whether it's from this podcast or from any meeting. I, I'm really lucky that I can go down to Tallow Beach and it's a beach here in the main beach of Byron, which is where there's a lot of people and literally a kilometre away is Tallow Beach and certainly any time I've had a lot of meetings or if I've been interstate, when I come home, the first thing I need, I know I need to do is go there and reconnect and I do that a lot by going in nature. Yeah, beautiful, me too. A bit of a, nature is, is my place of, um, chosen place of solitude, that's for sure. So can you suggest how we can get more alone time and reconnect with the self when, when the thought of it really freaks us out? Yeah, sure. I think, I think then you actually just say to yourself, I'm ready to release my resistance to alone time. And that would be my first thing I would suggest anybody does is they look in the mirror and say that to themselves and see what reaction they get and just keep saying it every day over and over again until they can look themselves in the eyes with love and then go, I'm ready for some alone time. And in that space, also ask, what am I scared of? And ask themselves, you know, you go within and say, what am I scared of here? And also, what do I need? And how much time do I need? Because I think sometimes people think alone time needs to be a lot or, and it's whatever the time is that is right for you. And I think if you really struggle to be in that space, you need to ask yourself whether or not you really feel connected and whether or not you even feel intimate with yourself or you fear that. Mm. Yeah. And uh, last question on that particular question is, I'm a bit of a lover of alone time, as I mentioned, and sometimes I fear that I can crave too much of it. <laughs> <laughs> so do you see a problem with that? Do you see a problem with um, humans you know, isolating themselves for one of a better way of saying it. I think for me personally, um, sometimes I can get too much of it where self-inflicted, where I feel as though it, like it's, it is too much that I do need to reconnect with people again. And I guess that's just being aware of what you need. But sometimes I feel that my head wants it more than my body and everything. I don't know if that makes sense. Makes complete sense. It makes me laugh too because I think I'm like you. <laughs> Look, I think when you've been, I've had a corporate career which was distraction and then I went to the other extreme which was to then be able to get into a place I'd say I could call it balance. However, I think the problem is society is telling us and always trying to work out what happiness is and what that looks like from the best perspectives and I know Deepak Chopra has certainly done some work on that and said you need to be around a group of people and you know um, as well as be seen and get positive feedback and and I actually it, that's not me you know I I'm happy to be alone and I have a partner and I've got friends and if you ask me where do was where is my life force and when do I feel my life force and complete connection to all that is and the truth of who I am and who I am as a being, I get that every second I'm in nature. Mm. Yet what I don't do is I don't get it when I'm with people because unfortunately what I see is defense, competition, uh, people trying to steal power. I call them energy vampires. Mm. And I see all of this and I go, well, do I really want to have to deal with this today? Mm. 
So some days I just go, no. And I have a lot of clients, so I'm obviously very much with people. And if you really ask me, I think, well, I've spent time where I've been alone for a year, you know. Mm. And, and I remember when I first moved up to Byron, I'd have people go, oh, it's great that you left the corporate world and what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know. And they were like, that's great, just give yourself time. And those same people, nine months later, were like, but you can't do nothing. You've got to start doing something. Mm. And I thought it was really extraordinary. I just looked at them and I said, well, why and what's changed? And that was then you become a mirror where people have to be with their own truth and what is now uncomfortable for them. And so for me, it's actually just about being true to who you are. Absolutely. If you true, and most of my clients say, I don't know where I fit. I feel I'm a fraud and I would rather be alone. Yeah. You know what that reminds me of when, when people were saying to you, you know, you can't be doing nothing. It reminds me of, I used to live in, um, at one of the places I lived in, in, in Sydney was Balbane and, and it was such a healing place. Actually, I was there on my own. I had no TV and I hadn't had a TV for a long time, but my, when my mum would come and visit, she would say, you've got to get a TV. Like, what do you do in the afternoons? Are you okay? Like she'd be so worried that I was alone. <laughs> and in <laughs> fact, I just, I loved it. I just loved, you know, I was quite social with my friends, but I would spend a lot of time on my own. And she was super concerned and it was her, her own stuff, you know, and, and obviously wanting the best for me and wanting to make sure that I was okay. And then that need to be alone wasn't anything that was depression or, you know, that sort of stuff, which she has experienced with me in the past. And that was a very different alone. That was isolation. That was shame of self. You know, I don't want to see the world. Um, so, but now the alone time for me is very sacred. It's very, I think, very healing. It's a chance for me to just reconnect with the self. And I, when I don't get that as often as I would like, I feel very discombobulated for a better way of yes. saying it. I don't feel right. I'm the same as you. You know, it's, I love it. Mm. And, and I, I would be quite happy to be in that space all the time. You know, if I'm really honest, mm. I get more and I feel more from my true connection with like on a universal level. If I'm looking at nature or the sky or the sea and the mountains and the birds and I see all this awe and you realize we are all connected and there is no competition in that space. Mm -hmm. Everything just is. And I think in that place you, I think one thing is that you need time if you really want to go deeper into yourself. And I was very lucky that when I first went on that journey, I wasn't in a relationship because I don't know how you could do it with somebody else there. You always get pulled away from yourself. Mm. And so I did give myself a gift of time, and that gift of time was for as long as it was going to take. Mm. And and that changed my life. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I would really miss people, I would have to say. Like, I do find that having those close to me nearby, like, you know, obviously Guy and other close friends in my life makes me – is important for me as well but it's almost like I need this balance I need this balance of both because I learn a lot about myself simply by being in a relationship or you know expressing my thoughts with close friends who don't judge who just listen who you know just accept me warts and all and so I think for me the combination of both is really healthy but sometimes I get caught up in others who are around me who constantly need to be doing something and distracted and I kind of go wow what's wrong with me that I need to take myself away and be alone <laughs> because I don't need to be distracted all the time but well I think you find uh, sorry if no, I interrupted you then. I find the same, you know, that when I, after I'd had that a long time alone, the end of that process was really falling in love with myself and for, at a core level. And then from that place, I knew I could fall in love. Mm. And I met my partner and we've been together ever since then. And I know, I think what you have with Guy, uh, you've met Kim, mm. um, I have with, with Kim. And there's something that is just it feels like it's of another world because it is so true yeah. and I've done my own healing work and Kim's done her own healing work so we're not here trying to heal each other we're actually here being and 
hopefully expanding and also giving space not to fix each other when we're going through our own process. We actually both know what that is and can give it space. And I agree with you. I think then you find that you attract people who are uh, in a similar space to you or where your next level of learning is meant to be and other people do fall away. And mm. I think that was what surprised me too was who fell away and some of them were close friends and then you realise, well, today actually I don't have that much in common with them. Mm. And when I was in that a corporate world and we all partied and we all went to nice restaurants and we all needed the latest and greatest, um, what we spoke about was very different to what I choose to speak about today because a lot of that just I have no interest in anymore. Mm. Yeah. So moving on from the alone, I've got a question for you about, I, I'm really intrigued about something you wrote, which was, if you use the word interesting to describe your emotional states, stop. Ask what feeling you are too scared to say and get back in touch with. Can you please expand on this? So let us know what you mean by that. Sure. I think the critical thing is that interesting is not an emotion. And so the reason this came up for me was that I was aware of um, conversations I was having with somebody and every answer to any question was it was interesting. And there were some major family dramas going on and a lot of uh, quite emotional uh, states, I think, were happening over a course of a period of time. And any time I spoke to this person, their answer to everything was, it's interesting, or that was interesting, or that. And I'd say, what does it mean? And they go, I don't know, it's interesting. And I thought, actually, this person has a block and can't feel anything. And it made, it was a mirror to me. And I went, well, any time I'm saying it, is it because I'm too scared to feel the truth of the magnitude of what's really going on? Mm. And, and, you know, seriously, for some people, letting in a feeling can result in a heart attack you know it's it's just we're so we've protected ourselves so much from feeling that that is now our new way of being so i think you've got to be really cautious if you haven't done that then if you don't know what the words are go to google look up emotional words mm -hmm. and check out check out and say well which one of these have i felt today and if you felt none of them ask yourself, well, am I really distracted from and disconnected from feeling? And just see, positive or negative. I think a lot of us, if we are in that space, have just numbed right out and also are not present in a conversation or present or connected to ourselves. Mm. And you know what, even though just, just um, thinking about that word interesting and I'm just tapping into when I've probably used it in the past, it was probably to suffocate a hurt to, or mm. that I was ashamed or you know not prepared to hear what someone had said or whatever so yeah no I can I can relate to that so so I don't hold you up too much longer I just got a couple more questions for you so first of all is there anything else that you would like to say to our audience the only thing is um, I would say is that for any person on the journey is to be gentle on themselves and really let them know that any shift is amazing mm -hmm. and that we forget to do that for ourselves and for your practitioners, you know, they're doing that in growing their own business or allowing in growth of their business. And so you go back and make sure you see the good, not just what you haven't done well. Mm -hmm. no, thank you. I like, uh, I like that permission. <laughs> and um, so if you weren't doing what you were doing right now, what do you think you'd be doing? I think I would, I think, well, at the moment, this moment in time, it's obviously what I'm meant to be doing. And I think I would be, I can see myself always doing speaking events and writing, actually, whether that be around behavioural economics and behaviour or being more authentic in your life and being more authentic in business. And the other side, which Linda, you know, is I, I do like photography and I think if I had a, if I had been surrounded by different experiences through my schooling and upbringing, I probably would have done that on a, and been an international photographer actually and being completely connected with nature in that space. Yeah, I've seen some of your beautiful photos and you've got a website dedicated to your photography, don't you? Oh, yes, I do. Aren't yeah. you lovely? Yeah, but you do. So yeah, what is... Well, 
brings me on to the next question then. Where can we find you outside? If you've got the, um, is it just Sonia Friedrich Photography? Yes, soniafriedrichphotography.com. Yep. And I, I have to say I haven't really done much in that space for the last couple of years. However, it is back on my agenda, which is fantastic. And um, for other work, people can go and visit soniafriedrich.com just to see some of my case studies at that corporate level. And I do run um, academies at Elements of Byron, and I'm about to launch some audio programs because a lot of people have been asking me where they can where they can get some more information from me. So, um, you know, just visit soniafriedrich.com or send me an email. So do you want to tell us a little bit more about your workshops? Is it just for the, the um, at L Elements or are you taking requests to say, go to a different state if someone would sure. like for that to be in their corporate environment? Absolutely, thank you for that uh, segue. I, um, I do a lot of corporate speaking and general speaking events. So, I can travel around Australia for those or internationally, so I'm more than happy to do that for corporate conferences, for association conferences as well. And uh, a lot of my programs that I run um, in the public setting, some of the businesses want it solely for their business. So what I do is I actually usually go to their business and work with their executive teams. And I do work mostly with CEOs and directors, whether they are from major multinationals to you know like yourself you're a, the solo director of your business i do work a lot one on one so with small business owners who are wanting to get to the next level and also owners who are in crisis and sometimes on their last resort before they have to go under and help them save their business so it's a little bit of a mixed bag but i love the i love the speaking events and i'd like to do more of them and i'd love to travel around the world actually on behalf of somebody and, and share what i know Beautiful. And when um, when do you think you'll get your your online programs available to people? Well, my first audio is finished, um, and that is that one. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yay. <laughs> and and that's really actually taking people through the process of really aligning themselves in life and in business. And the next ones will be I'm doing one specifically around commitment contracts. And then I'll be doing some behavioural economic ones around pricing and different aspects of behavioural economics. So it will just be an ongoing rollout. I, my guess would be the first one will be live probably May, June of this year. Um, if anybody wants it before then, I'm more than happy to sell it to them um, directly rather than having it live on the website. Beautiful. So I'll pop all your details in the show notes. Um, and you still work with people one on one? Yes, yeah, so I have quite a lot of uh, personal mentoring clients, so that's where people want to change some aspect of their personal life. I'm working one-on-one -on -one in business context with a number of directors, and then I also work, and with that, it's both personal development in business as well as then the application of behavioural economics for their business. Yeah, beautiful, and I highly recommend people get in contact. I've worked with Sonia both professionally and personally, and I've made some major shifts because of it. I think the reason why I've really honed in on digestive health is because you lured that out of me like you <laughs> you lured out my that, eh? yeah because I was all over the place and I think that it was I really set up some strong foundations simply by working with you and moving through some stuff and even um you know even down to public presentations and that sort of personal thing moving through some barriers there has just been absolute gold so everyone get in contact if this resonates with you Absolutely. Thank you so much and thanks for those kind words. It's always been a pleasure working with you and thank you for the invitation to speak with you on Love and Guts. I should be thanking you first, Sonia. Thank you for coming. <laughs> You're too pleasant. <laughs> Taking the initiative. <laughs> Wouldn't expect any less. No, thank you so much. I, I'm, I so appreciate you taking your time out and I know that loads of people are going to get a lot out of this. I'm going to listen to this multiple times, I am sure. But um, stay on the line. I'm just going to say goodbye to everyone. Again, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. If you like what you hear, please subscribe on iTunes and make sure that you leave a ratings and a review because that's how others find Love and Guts easily. And they can also fill up on the content from our valuable experts. 
Thank you for listening to Love and Guts. If you would like to get on top of your digestive or overall health, you can schedule your naturopathic and nutrition consultation with me via my website under the tab labeled book and appointment. You can also purchase a bag or three of my lovingly created Better Me Tea, an all organic herbal tea blend that helps promote healthy daily bowel movements and reduce some common digestive complaints. And if you have someone in your life that you know would benefit from the podcast, from the tea, or from a consultation with me, feel free to share everything with your friend.